just go ahead and get started. So first, a quick overview of where we are and where we are going. So today we will be looking for our second class. Excuse me, I think your microphone is not working. Ah, oh, it's on, but huh. Oh. Please maybe just do the volume off again. Okay, is it? Oh, let me just keep that. How, is, is that better? Not really. Oh, not. Oh, it's not. Do you think it's working? I think so, yeah. Maybe I'm just old and deaf. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, well, not, it's not as loud as it normally is. Yes. Oh, I really? It. it says it's on. I'm not sure if I can control the window or if they are on two. Oh, so, so you don't control. Well, I will just try to speak up. So, so if, I, if I speak like this, is that still hearable? OK, don't hesitate to, to make little motions if my voice falters, which it will probably tend to do. Um, or conversely, if I'm speaking too loudly, feel free to. <laughs> to make motions to say tough, right? So let me give a few words about where we are in the class and where we are going. So beginning last week, we introduced the theme of self-fashioning and non-conformity, which as we argue is a very different attempt to naturalize and secularize Christianity, very different in particular from the forms of political liberalism, as well as the philosophical schools that we began our class with, all of which, as we noted, take a very reductionistic view of how we're to secularize and naturalize Christianity. And beginning last week, we turned to thinkers who um, certainly would not be called reductionistic in any sense of that term. <laughs> so we looked at Emerson and Nietzsche, both of whom, on the contrary, wanted to focus in particular, not on love, that's an issue we'll come back with, back to, but in particular on transcendence and creativity, both were strongly committed to the idea that that transcendence and creativity should be located in divinized humans. Those humans, those limited humans, the elite who could so reach this goal would be seen and called upon to be incredibly creative, refusing to conform to any of the rest of the world, any norms that exist, all of which would be, in Nietzsche's strong terminology, just a third morality that should be rejected entirely. And this vision of extraordinary self-assertion is, we have argued, a dominant theme over these past two centuries. Um, however, it too has been dramatically reduced in its times. America being an obvious and extreme example of that, where a lot of these words, terms, have become part of our common parts without, you know, to say, <laughs> the kind of power that you would see in an Emerson and a Nietzsche. So our goal beginning last week was to say if this is an incredibly powerful tradition, but one that is beginning to lose itself, how would we rethink it? Not just in the sense of how do we regain the power of an Emerson or Nietzsche, but in a stronger sense to say, what were the flaws in that theorization and that understanding that we now need to rethink such that we could reconstitute and reconstruct this vision of radical creativity and nonconformity? And what would it mean to do that in terms philosophically, in terms of the conduct of life, and even in terms of our political projects. In order to help us do this, we have given you two readings for this week. The first is by Simon May, who is a contemporary philosopher, very much focused on Nietzsche. And it's a careful reading of Nietzsche, but a very critical reading of Nietzsche, arguing that there's an incredibly powerful vision of life affirmation here that he wants to preserve. He is also very critical of a lot of the specifics of the ways that Nietzsche does it, particularly with the intervention related concepts. And Simon May's book is about trying to rescue the power of Nietzsche while avoiding what he sees as its more dangerous elements. And of course, our second work is my co teacher, Roberto Unger, whose work, among many, many, many other things, involves exactly this project. It is rethinking entire vision of self-affirmation, creativity, and non-conformity, rethinking its flaws and trying to reconstitute in a way that would bring back its revolutionary power 
and hopefully in a more powerful form than the earlier forms it has taken. So our goal for this class will be to look in depth at this reconstruction and going through these flaws in depth, going through the possible reconstruction in depth, and thinking through its implications. And then just going quickly forward, beginning next week, we will spend two weeks doing the same thing with the entire theme of connection, where in the first week of that, the week after spring break, we will look at early Confucian writings, and we will, we will argue to have an early powerful vision of what such an epic would be. And in that second week, right after that, we will then turn to its reconstruction for the present day as well. And then the remaining weeks will be arguing through these two positions vis-a-vis -vis where we have come over the course of the class. So with that as a statement as to where we are now and where we are going, let us jump into this reconstruction of the theme of self-fashioning and nonconformity. And to do so, I would like to invite Roberto to go over again these four fundamental flaws that he has argued limited dramatically the power of these early formulations in the 19th century. And we will use that as a starting point to then do our full reconstruction. So with Roberto, let me turn things over to you. So uh, the aim of those lines of criticism is really to reconstruct this epic. Yes. To reconstruct it, to purge it of its most obvious defect. And by that means to presented in its most powerful form, uh, because then the dis our discussion of it in its most powerful form will be more promising than the simple criticism of its obviously flawed version. And in that spirit, I then suggested four lines of criticism. And remember, the first one had to do with the concept of self-fashioning itself. And what is involved, what is presupposed by the making of a self, a self that is able to come more fully into the possession of life uh, in the present moment, that is in the medium of time, and to become more human by becoming more childlike. A self that is able, instead of dying little by little, by installments, as it were, to die anymore. And the suggestion was that what are, there are many ways in which we can do that. And one of the ways we can do that is by recognizing that self-fashioning is problematic or conflictual, that it is internally disharmonious, uh, uh, that it's not a simple program. Uh, and in particular, according to the argument I made last week, that it results from our engagement with a series of contradictions. These contradictions have to do with the relation of the self to others, uh, with the relation of the self to a particular social and cultural world, and finally with the relation of the self to itself. So let's just remember what the contradictions were. So first, the self and others. Jean Paul Sartre said, others are hell. Uh, and that's the uh, dramatic. Horrible thing to say about hell, but none of us. <laughs> that's a dramatic expression of the idea of uh, this, this irreconcilability uh, within humanity and within the other. Uh, no one is anything without connection without connection to particular others. But according to this view, every connection places us in jeopardy. The jeopardy of losing personal distinction and more dramatically of being subjugated. So we're nothing without the others, but with the others which threaten the subjugation and loss of personal distinction. How then can we be free, taking this ethic as an ethic of agency, of the enhancement of the country, and of vitality? Uh, freedom viewed as 
the affirmation of vitality and the enhancement of agency. How can we be free if there is this contradiction? And the answer then is that we can be free only to the extent that we succeed in moderating this contradiction. And that we can connect by connections that exact from us less of a price in subjugation or depersonalization. Now, one of our supreme expressions of success in that enterprise is in love. Because in love, we have the idea that we're able to connect with someone in such a way that the connection adds to us rather than subtracting from us. Uh, and that's why love has, as we suggested in the earlier talks, an imaginative threshold. It's, it's not, it involves more than sacrifice. It involves the imagination of the other and of the otherness of the other uh, in order to achieve this superior form of reconciliation between the need for connection and the avoidance of this jeopardy of depersonalization and subjugation. But love has this problem that it, in principle, flourishes <coughs> only in the domain of intimacy. And therefore, we have to go in search of a proxy for it outside the domain of intimacy. Now, in general, the moral philosophers in the modern West, and the ones who in particular are revered by the school philosophy, offer us, instead of love, the cold comfort of an impersonal and altruistic benevolence. Uh, and this impersonal and altruistic benevolence, which is their subject, uh, doesn't really respond to the problem once it's formulated in this way, which is how we can have connection without subjugation and depersonalization. So the alternative to this idea of an impersonal and altruistic benevolence would be cooperation, uh, and cooperation among free and equal individuals. But of course, all of the particular institutional forms of such cooperation are contested and contestable. And they're the object of the conflicts that fill up history. So for example, if one form of cooperation among free and, free and equal individuals is the market, the question then becomes, which market? The market order has no single natural and necessary form. And different forms have not only different distributive consequences, but different consequences for the organization of production and of change. Uh, and in politics, the same thing. You could say democracy is a form of cooperation among free and equal individuals. But then which democracy? These weak and flawed democracies that exist in the world, or another democracy, and so forth. So that then becomes a source of conflict. Now that they are a source of conflict does not mean that they're not the best solution to this problem. But it's a solution that comes with another set of complications. So that's the first argument that this this that it rests on, on this contest of presuppositions, this contradictory character. And we are free then to the extent that we succeed, not necessarily in resolving this contradiction, but in weakening its force. The second contradiction has to do with the relation of the self to a particular world. No one is free unless he is engaged in a particular world, unless he is a participant in a society and the culture. He has a role vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, and he has a whole conceptual regime in which he can participate. But if the price of participation in that world is surrender to it, if we allow that world to have the last word, 
rather than keeping the last word to ourselves, we are also not free. And thus arises a second contradiction. So somehow we must find a way of engaging, of participating, without surrendering. And we must seek those regimes uh, in economic and in political life that allow us to participate without surrendering. And to the extent that we fail to achieve that collectively in politics, we must somehow achieve it through our own striving, through the way in which we organize our relation to the society and find a way to be both insiders and outsiders. And to phrase the same idea more ambitiously in theological language, to obey Christ's command to be in the world without being of it. That's the second contradiction and the second condition of our freedom. Uh, and in politics and in the organization of the market, it's related to a theme of great political significance now and in the future. And that is how we can create economic and political institutions which instead of presenting themselves as take it or leave it, uh, facilitate and organize their own revision in the light of experience. Because those institutions that have this character of organizing experimentalism would be the institutions that allow us to participate in that surrender. And the third contradiction in the concept of self-fashioning has to do with our relation to ourselves. So to be free, to make a self, to enhance agency, and therefore to extend our quota in the divine attribute of transcendence, uh, we must form a coherent way of being. The self cannot just be a disorganized amalgam of different impulses. Uh, it, must, it must have an organization and an order. And this order is what the ancients call the character. And they said, character is destiny. But the combination of a character with a circumstance to which we resign ourselves then threatens to become a mummy, a carapace, a shell to which we seed life. The character threatens to suck the life out of us and to deny us the attributes of vitality, uh, excess, spontaneity, and surprise. So it's not enough to form this coherent way of being. We also have to possess and affirm our ability to disrupt from within this coherent way of being, as it were, to break out of the mummy. Uh, and we may not be able to do so by a direct exercise of the will, but the will nevertheless may have a powerful indirect role by forcing us into situations of heightened vulnerability in which we, uh, looking for trouble rather than staying out of trouble, have a better chance of escaping the tyranny of the character. And this, therefore, is another contradiction. And it's a contradiction with more than just political consequences. It has also moral consequences. It has political consequences because you might say one of the responsibilities of a state that supports this, the, the freedom, the agency of the citizens, is it should help them reinvent themselves, and, uh, change their careers, their form of life at different points. Uh, but it's also more directly and above all the responsibility of the individual to find this way of disrupting his character and rebelling against his circumstances. So, that's the simple proposition that unifies these arguments. It's the idea that the concept of self-fashioning, the enhancement of agency, 
the affirmation of life in the present moment, the increase of our quota of the divine attribute of transcendence is not unproblematic. It is contradictory. Uh, and this contradiction was on the whole, I think, not recognized or at least not adequately recognized by the philosophers of agency like Nietzsche and Emerson. And so we'll do it right now. We'll do it in, in ourselves. And by doing it, we will begin to uh, shape uh, a more defensible version of the ethic of self-fashioning and non conformity So that's just a restatement of yeah. the view. Uh, <laughs> and I will give a quick commentary, and then let's open it up. But first, a quick because what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of the arguments, right? Oh yes, yes. Oh, yes. yes. oh yes. Oh yes. Oh, actually, yes. Go ahead. Yes. That's the first argument. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I will give a very brief commentary, and then we will turn to the next. So the brief commentary I will make here is. Note what Roberto is doing. <laughs> You've seen this in the writings, of course, and you're seeing it today, and I just want to underline the significance. So one way of thinking about Nietzsche is here is a figure who takes the notion of a transcendent creative God, namely God of the Christian God, and moves it to the level of humans, but the limited humans, the Ubermensch, the notion of love drops out almost entirely. And it is very strongly a philosophy of the will, and the philosophy of the will put in its strongest possible terms. Um, when you read a lot of Nietzsche going well beyond what we read, especially in his notebooks where he gets quite extreme, much more extreme even than his, his actual published works, it's all about this radical assertion of the will, always this incredibly strong sense of the courage of the uber mention, his, his will to transform the world. Note what Roberto is doing with all of these concepts. Yes, transcendence and creativity from the Christian God now move to humanity, but when he does so, he absolutely builds in the notion of love, which drops out largely almost entirely from Nietzsche. Now it's put as an intrinsic part of what it means to be a self ashening figure. Note also with the concept of the will, what Roberto is doing. As he has just noted, will for Roberto means, among other things, placing ourselves in positions of vulnerability. So we are being challenged. We are being forced to break down our vision of what I properly am, what the world properly should be, based on the notion that one danger of a philosophy of the will is, of course, we will form a character that will become unchanging and, again, will unshackle us. And so the goal of the will is we are putting ourselves in positions of vulnerability so we will be challenged. <laughs> we will be forced to break down to then reconstitute ourselves anew. And, and oh, yeah, let's jump in. Uh, this is an idea that we are astonished the ancients. Yes, oh, completely. <laughs> the, the theme of pagan philosophy was stay out of trouble, yes. serenity. Yes. Uh, and this is exactly the opposite of Christian. Yes. Uh, Seek trouble. Right? Yes. Uh, so it's not the model of the self as a fortress yes. into which you receive. Yes. It's the opposite. Uh, tear down the walls. Uh, cast away the shield for the sake of ascent to a higher form. Yes. Yes. And one other point before we move on to the second one. Note also, and this will move us toward the, the political program that we'll get to in a couple of, of these steps, but first to point toward it at this stage, note also what Roberto is doing with emotional structure. The structure is not simply, as in Singer's romantic view, that my radical creativity is an endless rebellion against some preset structure. Rather, Roberto is conceptualizing the structure in a broad sense, very much including the shell of a character that we can we can become entrapped by. And in all of these notions of structure, the key is how do we develop structures that are open to constant reworking? That is true of the self. So the self cannot 
become a structure that would then become our character that would define us. On the contrary, it requires constantly our placing ourselves in positions of vulnerability so that structure will constantly be questioned. And the same is true for the structures of our lives. So at a political level, we'll discuss this more in depth, but just quickly with the foreshadowing of what's to come, at political structure, you are developing institutions that always are not only open to a constant rethinking, but actually you build in the requirement of doing so constantly. So instead of a world where you have a relatively unchanging institutional order that has been changed in radical moments of crisis, it becomes built in such that that is part of the workings. So instead of a transcendent self in a structure and an endless battling of the two, the structure becomes something that the self is being defined <laughs> with and against precisely because the structure is constantly being rechanged and renegotiated accordingly. And again, others also cease to be structures in such a view in a, in a negative way. Others, based on this notion of Christian love, become the key way by which our self fashioning operates. So through all of these steps, what Roberto is doing is giving us a way of working in creativity, transcendence, and love in ways that don't, and a vision of the will, in ways that undercut the ways these were being articulated by Nietzsche, and therefore, not only questioning their flaws, but building an attention that would hopefully prevent us from falling into those flaws. So a brief commentary, and she would, oh, she actually, let's open this up, and then we'll move to the next one. So yes, thoughts or questions for this first stage of the argument? Yes, please. <laughs> I can offer something. Please. Uh, I, I, I guess my question is, I think it would depend on the circumstance, but it's, it seems necessary to have kind of a minimalist and maximalist version of baking in change to ourselves and our structures all the time. Because I think, I think it's accurate because you know, people say the only constant is change. But if you, have, if, you, if you come to a community of people or a political project and there is, there is no foundation that is kind of sacred, doesn't it kind of frustrate people even, even in terms of conceptual action? So is there is there any kind of abstract response that one could say, okay, we're going to have we're going to have constant change, but it's going to be a, a minimalist change in step by step as you as you as you've said before, not this kind of maximalist change where any any anytime you come to sit at the table, everything is open to critique or 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 sort of what I was saying last week, that the, that the self has to be undone. Uh, nothing is so something something about finding so that line. That right there, there's a there's a confusion we all have uh, about the idea of structural change. And the confusion takes the form of a conflation of the distinction between structural and non-structural change with the distinction between moderate or extreme change. Those are two different things. So. And part of the reason for this confusion is the immense influence of classical European social theory, and especially Marxism. So in Marxist theory, we have this idea that there are systems, institutional systems. Marx calls them the modes of production, the slave economy, feudalism, capitalism, and socialism. Each of them is an indivisible system. So structural change in Marxist theory means the substitution of one of these indivisible systems for another. And what results from that is a binary idea of politics. Politics is either reformist, meaning it's the management or humanization or improvement of one of these systems, or it's revolutionary, meaning it's the substitution of one indivisible system for another. But I think that's all false. And that structural change, when it happens in history, as it often does, is almost always piecemeal, fragmentary. It can nevertheless be cumulative. And this idea, this binary idea of politics, that it's either reformist or revolutionary, serves, in fact, as an alibi for its opposite. So then people think real change would be this revolutionary change. 
It's not in the cards. Uh, if it were in the cards, it would be too dangerous. So what's left to do is to manage the existing world, to humanize it. So then the, so the institutionally conservative social democrats, uh, the humanizers of the inevitable, many of them ex-Marxists, appear on the scene motivated by this false idea. Uh, so I don't think we, so the important thing is the direction, not how far you go in any one step. And there's a huge difference between what's structural and what's not structural. So in politics, for example, everything that's really important leaves an institutional and ideological legacy. But what's not structural, which is just the reallocation of resources from one use to another use, it's like the waves of the sea. It comes and it's undone. That's, that's not enduring. So I think that's what we should fix on. Now the, now the question then is, how do we picture structural change? And if it has this fragmentary and piecemeal character, and I go back to that general idea that we have two sets of moves. We have ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted, and then extraordinary moves by which from time to time, under the pressure of crisis, we challenge and change pieces of the framework. Now, what, what these ideas signal is that part of our ambition would be to narrow the distance between these two sets of moves so that the so-called extraordinary moves arise more constantly and naturally out of the ordinary business of life. And then we would be freer. Now, this doesn't apply just to politics. It applies to everything. So for example, take a completely different realm, like epistemology and the, the history of science. So you know Thomas Kuhn's idea. There's normal science and there's revolutionary science. Normal science is the, the routinized science that occurs under a theoretical paradigm. Then the geniuses come from time to time and they break and reshape the paradigm. Uh, now, what would increase the power of science is if normal science took on some of the attributes of revolutionary science. And then this distinction would diminish. And according to the direction of this idea, that's what we should see in every domain of our existence. So, and that has consequences then for this contrast between the elite of investors, disruptors, and profits, and everyone else. So in theological language, we would say, the Protestant Reformation familiarized us with the idea that of the priesthood of all believers. So there are no appointed intermediaries between the believer and God. But now we have this, this idea, which is in a way a radicalization of that, which is the, the, the widespread diffusion of prophetic powers in the whole of humanity. Everyone is a prophet, and not just everyone is a priest and the gates of prophecy are never closed. Uh, so that's, that's how this takes on also a political coloration. Yes, please. I want to ask a question about the will. I, I really find your framing of the role of the will in the transformation of the self compelling. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems to me that there's also a contradiction within the life of the will. What I mean by that is you suggest that the will can guide us into increasing vulnerability, which catalyzes transformation. But we also, from my point of view, are very ambivalent about vulnerability and transformation. We're just as good at defending against vulnerability as seeking it. So practically speaking, 
how do we cause the will, how do we will ourselves into vulnerability when we're just as defended against vulnerability as we are craving it? You mean there's a circularity, but I think it's impossible for the will to produce directly this result mm -hmm. of transformation. Mm -hmm. But it is possible for the will motivated by an idea, including a moral philosophy, to have an indirect effect. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly find that. I think we all find that in our experience. So, uh, but, but more directly, how do we will something that part of us doesn't want to will? Maybe you heard that the first time, but that's kind of the part of the question. Maybe it's more psychological in nature. Than well, maybe well. you could forgive me for uh, uh, giving a personal example. I would and then insist you on it. The light <laughs> example when, when you find puzzling. Thank you. So, uh, when I started to teach and to write, and people attacked my ideas, as they often do, uh, <laughs> I was immensely pained and bothered uh, by these attacks. You know? After a few years, I stopped being bothered at all. I became completely indifferent uh, to the attacks, which previously had upset me so much. Uh, uh, and so it's as if I then found myself here in this garden in Cambridge, Massachusetts, <laughs> wearing involuntarily a coat of armor that no arrow could pierce. <laughs> so this is, this, it doesn't take very much thinking to conclude that this is bad huh? and that this is the inimical to life. Uh, and so it's necessary to take off the coat of armor. Now, what can I do to take off the coat of armor? Now, one thing that you can do is to go into politics. Because <laughs> if you go into politics, especially in another country, your coat of armor will be ripped off. <laughs> you know, I won't have to do it. You'll be subject to defeat, to derision, to ridicule. All sorts of things will happen to you. Uh, and but, and you, you will have done that following a prescription which was the opposite of the pagan wisdom. Now, why is that so mysterious? Is, is, isn't that something that can happen in our experience? Of course. So, I mean, I'm to directly answer your question of the will. I'll reflect on that. <laughs> so, and I think if you follow that, that idea a little more, uh, say, because we've spoken at different times here in the course about the relation between biographical time and historical time, moral and political. So, and it seems to me that there are two opposing errors. So one error is to take the view like the Leninist view, that the individual serves the collective project. Uh, he's, a, he's an instrument. If he was born at the wrong time of history, too bad. Huh? Mm -hmm. History has, has dealt him a bad hand of cards, but he has to accept that to serve the collective instrument of humanity. Then we become like ants, right? Uh, and that's not us, so it's dehumanizing. On the other hand, if your attitude to politics is the attitude of romanticism, you say, this is a wonderful adventure. I'm not interested in the, in the practical consequences, but I am interested in the adventure. Uh, and that also is a perversion. So I think what we have to hope is that there's some kind of parallelism or affinity between the problem for society and the problem for the individual. So that by engaging in this activity, in which you as an individual will find greater freedom, and be able to disrupt the rigidified form of the self, you will engage in it because you've taken sides in some collective conflict, mm -hmm. and you hope the right side. And so there'll be this convergence. Uh, then yeah. you'd be lucky, right? It would be a form of moral luck, and that's what you strive for. That, that's incredible. I mean, what I hear from your response there is by your caring about the world enough to try to change it, you became vulnerable. You engaged in a loving act with it, and it changed you. At least that's what I hear as I'm kind of yes. connecting dots. Yes, but, it's, but you're, also, you're also interested in your self-transformation. Of course. Because you change yourself by trying to change the world, right? Indeed, yeah. That's what usually happens. We 
try to change the world and we fail, but then we find that we did succeed in changing something else. And the something else that we succeed in changing is ourselves. Huh? Um, but then this, this, this attempt to say the world can't be just like a play actor. Mm. You have to have belief in it. Uh, and, and to done your best for it to work, for this moral benefit to exist. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Is it fair to say that the ethic of nonconformity doesn't have truth as an important concept? It seems that what they're saying is like, whatever is mainstream, that's not it. That's what you need to stick to. No, I think it does have truth as an important uh, element. But, and this will come up directly in our subsequent discussion of Prometheanism another flaw in this, because the object, one of the fundamental objections to what I call Prometheanism is that Prometheanism is a form of self-deception. It's that the individual can say to himself. Uh, and it misrepresents our relation to the others, to society, and so forth. So it's moral truth. Uh, so I don't think that the truth is irrelevant. I think that, of course, political truth is complicated because it's not, it's not uh, transparent and linear. Uh, but truth in this larger sense of moral truth is very directly relevant to these questions and very directly engaged. So the, the flawed form of the ethic of self-fashioning is, is, is Deceiving. It's a form of self deception. That's one of the objections to it. It's not in the truth, that you're not living in the truth. Should we go to the second? Absolutely. So you remember the second objection is that the ethic of self fashioning lacks an adequate political horizon. To the extent that it has a political program, the political program is objectionable. This was for, in, in, in the voice that it had for the, for the liberal political philosophy. And, uh, and to the extent that it didn't have an explicit political program in the philosophers of agency, like Emerson and Nietzsche, yeah, we suspect that it had uh, the wrong political program bad political program. And by default, it tended to this distinction between the elite of inventors and disruptors and nonconformists, the rebels, and everyone else. Everyone else is the herd of conformists over which the elite prevails. Huh? I think the middle case here is romanticism, because romanticism does have a kind of an explicit political program, but it is vitiated by an inadequate understanding of the relation between spirit and structure. So let's pause for a moment on the concept of spirit, which has such heavy theological and philosophical baggage in the West. What does spirit mean? Spirit means uh, Life, the affirmation of life, of consciousness, confronting structure. And the term spirit signals this idea that there's more in us than there is in the structure. So the spirit is precisely our power to act against the structure and beyond the structure. That's the spirit. And the romantic conception then, the flawed, wrong, untruthful romantic conception is that we are truly ourselves, we are truly human and free, only in those interludes in which we shake the structures. But the structures are fated to come back. So they will come back, the hand of Midas will come back, and it will kill the spirit. Huh? And we will have been free in those little moments. So, 
what do we what 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 is then our failing? It's that we despair of our power to change the relation between spirit and structure. To create a structure in society or in the self character which is more hospitable to spirit uh, and diminishes this conflict. So Kierkegaard, uh, who is also sympathetic to many of these ideas, said, I think it's a very penetrating observation, that the war against repetition is a war against life. So life is full of repetition and full of structure. So the issue is not somehow our power entirely to suppress the element of structure. The idea is it's our hope of changing the relation of spirit to structure, of self to structure. Now, all of that is just by way of background to this question, which this second, second argument raises. What then should be the political horizon of this ethic? And what I would want to say and is it should be what I would call a politics of deep freedom. So we can't develop this now because in this course, our agenda is not an agenda of exploring institutional change and institutional determinants. But let me at least signal the kind of thing that's involved in this process. So we could say, uh, the conventional ideological dispute now in the advanced societies, especially in the North Atlantic world, imagines that there is a contest between the, the right and the left, which is organized in the following way, that the right represents shallow freedom, and the right are those who give priority to shallow freedom, meaning freedom against the background of the established form of democracy and of the market. And the left gives priority to shallow equality against the same background. That's why they're both shallow. So for example, take the theories of distributed justice that are influential in the Anglo-American world, like the Rawlsian theory of justice. They appear to be very abstract. It's a social contract theory. There's a whole conceptual focus, focus, veil of ignorance and a social contract. But what they really do is to attempt to provide a, a philosophical, a pseudo-philosophical prop to the holy practices of compensatory redistribution. Progressive taxation and social entitlements, redistributive social spending, under institutionally conservative social democracy. That's what they do. And the principles of justice and redistribution are to adorn to support that conclusion. So there's a paradox in these theories. So they seem to be radically egalitarian. But then the egalitarianism is downside to this retrospective redistribution. Uh, it doesn't take the form. It's not expressed as a radical change in the structure, either the economic structure or the political structure. So that's the conventional shape of the ideological dispute in the late 20th century and today. It wasn't, I think, the way in which the liberals and socialists understood their cause in the 19th century. They had a, they had a, a different idea. Their idea was that the, their objective was freedom. Their objective was not radi radical, deep, what we call deep equality, that is, equality of outcome or circumstance that everyone should have the same level of wealth and income, the same way of living, and so forth. Their objective is that we should become bigger together. Uh, and entrenched or radical inequality was, of course, a burden on that. So they were against radical inequality. But their opposition to radical inequality was accessory to their main goal, 
And their main goal was this idea of a shared empowerment. We rise up together. Uh, unfortunately, this, the, the conception of this shared greatness was too small because it was modeled on the aristocratic experience of self-possession, like the little lord in his, in his land and his property. And above all, their, uh, their practice, their institutional proposal was too dogmatic. So each faction of the left and of the liberals said, here's, here's the way. This is the blueprint. Enact this movement and you'll become both rich and free. Uh, and now we know that it's not like that. That there is there aren't these dogmatic blueprints that can automatically ensure the conversion of economic prosperity and political freedom. Uh, so the politics of deep freedom would have as its goal shared empowerment, becoming bigger together. And then who is the right and who is the left? under that view. Uh, the right are all of those who think that it's natural for human life to be small. Human life is naturally small for the vast majority of men and women, unless and until they are freed from this smallness by some great event in the world, like a war, a world war, like in war and peace, like Napoleon's invasion of Russia. They look up at the sky, they see Haley's Comet. We've already spoken about Haley's Comet. It's a presage of Napoleon's invasion of Russia. And then they know everyone is going to be taken out of the rut of this long littleness of life. Huh? Uh, and the left are all those who think it's, not, it's unnatural for human life to be small. We can become bigger together. And it's not just an elite of heroes, geniuses, entrepreneurs who will become bigger. We will all become bigger. So that's, as it were, the spiritual distinction between right and left, which is the basis of this other idea of the ideological conflict. And then the second distinction has to do with the method or the practice. So. The left are all those, the progressives are those who believe that our interests and ideals have to be pursued through structural change. That is beyond the boundaries of the present institutional and ideological settlement. But not according to the old Marxist idea of what this transgression of the boundaries is like. Not in the form of one indivisible system replacing another structural change being fragmentary, piecemeal, but with the potential to be cumulative. And the right are all of those who accept the institutional and ideological horizon as circumscribing the reach of our pursuit. And that then leads us to the search for alternative forms of democracy and of the market. So we have to, for example, democratize the market order. Uh, and radically extend the range of agents, of social agents, of social groups who can have access to the most advanced practice of production, the most mindful practice, and the practice that, because it is most mindful, closest to the imagination, most fully reveals our powers. That today is the knowledge of God. So the knowledge economy exists only in an insular form. And we would say we want it to exist in an inclusive form. We want to take the, the insular knowledge economy and replace it by an inclusive knowledge economy. And in politics, we want to create high energy democracies that diminish the dependence of change on crisis. We want to raise the temperature the level of organized popular engagement in political life. We want to hasten the pace, developing constitutional mechanisms for the rapid resolution of impasse. And we want to create in political society a dialectic 
that allows for the coexistence between strong action by the central government and radical devolution to the local authorities. So in other words, as society goes down a certain path, it hedges its bets and allows parts of itself to secede from the dominant solutions and to generate counter models of the national future. It's the general character of, a, of what I'm calling the high energy democracy. And of course, we have to change the character of education. So we have to create a school that is able to recognize in every young person a tongue-tied prophet and that will then give primacy to the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the imagination. It will seek to acquire them in the way it deals with content, because it can't be acquired in a vacuum of content, by selective depth rather than by encyclopedic superficiality. So it will have to be a form of education that is schematic or project-oriented. In its social setting, it must be cooperative rather than juxtaposing individualism and authoritarianism. And above all, it must be dialectical. Every subject must be taught at least twice from opposing points of view. Uh, and so we'll form a mind which is able to, to rebel, to do what the philosophers of agency wanted, but now not just for the elite, for everyone. So that's what I would say is the missing political horizon of this epic, once it is corrected in the way I and again, I will give a brief commentary and then we'll open it up. So, as Roberto has argued, the dialectic that we see playing out with these different forms of naturalizing and secularizing Christianity have taken the following forms. The dominant <coughs> form by far, currently in liberal democratic societies, is one in which largely unchangeable structures completely dominate. The example being, as Roberto has mentioned, we'll use America as a clear example, you have largely unchangeable governmental system, a largely unchangeable set of laws guiding the market, and the entire political debate comes down simply to slight variations in the level of the redistributions. So by this I mean literally a political debate that has been ongoing since the 1980s is should tax rates be 32% or 36%? And that's the entire debate. Um, now there happens to be a lot at stake in that. Actually those 4% makes a big difference. But I emphasize that to say think of the difference it makes if you widen that. <laughs> it's just it's incredible. This is literally the level of the political debate in America and it has been for decades. Which means, going back to the, the terminology for virtual was using here, structure completely dominates, and spirit, to the degree to which it plays out, plays out in the most minimal imaginable form, where we are all allowed to be individuals who theoretically have a chance to make a little bit of money with a very, very tightly constrained marketplace, which, in fact, we know, you can check the statistics on this, there is almost no social mobility in practice in America. And so you, the possible move that you personally can make individually is incredibly limited despite all of the rhetoric. And then as Roberto has mentioned, you get the revolts. So you will get the, again, I'll use the example because we read him closely, of the Nietzschean revolt against things like this. He was living in an earlier area, the era that you can imagine that revolt, which is to say this is simply a herd morality, and we must break from this, but as Roberto has argued, that simply says we will radicalize the notion of spirit against structure, but of course for a limited elite few who can be the ones that will stand up against the structure that otherwise dominates all of us. And Roberto's move here is to say, what if we, on the contrary, by building on Christian notions of radical love, say, no, the goal is, in fact, a dramatic enlargement of spirit, not, however, at the expense of others, but because of love, knowing we can only grow if we grow together, and precisely for that very reason, therefore, structure ends up being radically rethought, not as a relatively unchangeable form against which we are constantly revolting or 
not really revolting much at all, but rather the structure itself is constantly made to be valuable as indeed part of the work we are doing in our self fashioning So we are constantly working to rethink the structures within which we are enmeshed, which is again part of our growing, which again can only be done because as if we grow together, which requires again the constant revision of the structure. So as you can see, taking key elements that we've been tracing for the past two millennia in the Western tradition, but reworking them all dramatically to open up, to open up these extraordinary possibilities. Now, I don't think that the shared yes. empowerment is directly motivated by love. I think that love is not, cannot flourish outside the domain of intimacy. Uh, I think it's another idea. It's an idea of the enhancement of agency, shared empowerment that we become greater together yes. and increase this, our, our quota in, in the divine power of transcendence. Uh, so the, in this argument, the, the focus is on what's the real political horizon? So the, the classical liberals propose a, a dogma about the system of liberal rights. And they said it's neutral, and we know it's not neutral, and that there's a, the, the claim of neutrality in favor of this impersonal framework is always adduced in favor of its opposite. The claim of neutrality is a way of entrenching a particular system of rights against attack. So it's not neutral, and it will become less neutral, and it will be a source of oppression and inequality and of disempowerment. But nevertheless, this idea of neutrality, and neutrality has an affinity to another idea, which is legitimate and even indispensable, which is that a form of life be open to a wide range of contradictory experience, and then above all, it be corrigible, that we be able to correct it in the light of experience. So that corrigibility and contradiction are the legitimate counterparts to the illegitimate idea of neutrality. And they then lead us on the search for alternative economic and political arrangements. All of which are, of course, dangerous. And here we come to a statement of Alfred Mark Whitehead, uh, the business of the future is to be dangerous. Uh, very penetrating. <laughs> <laughs> and let us open it up again. <laughs> yes, please. So I just want to make sure I understand. So the, the epic of self-fashioning lacks a political horizon because it's putting too much emphasis on the on the spirit over structure instead of um, no, no. no, it's not quite that. Okay. Depending on which version you take. Okay. It, uh, it either has no explicit political horizon, okay. which is largely the case for the philosophers, or it has a political horizon which is unacceptable. That's the case of the liberal political uh, theory. Okay, so it can have so a political horizon. It either has none or it has a bad one, okay. or it has a mixture of not having one and having the wrong one, like okay. romanticism. Uh, but its politics are unacceptable. Okay. And, and of course, you need to take the view with respect to these ethics. By your fruits, you shall know them. So that if you have an ethic which then seems to produce the wrong political results, the unacceptable political results, you have reason to suspect it. So one of the ways in which you would correct it is by See, in what form would it yield better political results? That's the kind of Okay, thanks. Yes, please. If no one else, uh, this may or may not be sort of a non sequitur, but uh, <laughs> I don't think it is. I was, I was speaking with a friend who studies um, AI, and he sort of takes probably one of the most pessimistic positions that one could take with respect to it. But I think, uh, I guess sort of his argument was that these technologies, forget even love are not even programmed with friendliness and sort of as time programs of what 
for, I said, never mind love, they're not even programmed with the kind of friendliness. And I'm, I'm not an expert in this, in this kind of area, but basically his argument was that these, the, the kind of consideration that, uh, basically my point is, to what extent are either of you <laughs> in dialogue with people who are developing these technologies? Because well, I think everything that you say has immense relevance for where all well, this is going. But the question of technology, of course, evolved in the construction of the economic alternative. And very directly in the concerns of an ethic, of an ethic of self answering and unemployment. So let's take the following problem: the, the relation between the worker and the machine, and how, in general, people should relate to machines. So, in Henry Ford's assembly line, or in Adam Smith's pin factory, the workers worked as if they were machines. Their moods mirror the repetitious moods of the lathes, of the metal cutting lathes with which they work. And you could say that in a philosophy of agency, the general principle should be no human being should be condemned to do the work that could be done by a machine. Uh, so what, what is a machine and why do we have machines? So, Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm. And we can then embody the formula or an algorithm in a mechanical device, the machine. The point of the machine is then to do for us what we have learned how to repeat, so that we can reserve our supreme resource, our time, for the not yet repeated. So we run ahead of the machines. The machines have certainly greater, now already have greater computational power than we have. We can build into them a stochastic element, an element of randomness. But at least for the moment, we have something that they don't have, which is imagination. That is, we can distance ourselves from the phenomenon and subsume the existence under a range of possible variations in the domain of the adjacent possible. That's the imagination. And so what do we want? We want that the state politics influence the development of technology. So that technology not simply replace labor, although to some extent it always will replace labor, but that it will also enhance labor. And we'll, we'll think that the combination of the worker with, of, the, of the machine with the anti-machine, who is the worker with imagination, should in principle be much more powerful than either of them alone. So that's then a, a direct expression in, the polit in what I would take as the politics of freedom to our relation to the machine. Is a, a direct technological implication. I think, I think that's right. Can I respond? Do, you mind to Do you think those conversations are happening? Because I think uh, I mean, my friend is, is pretty pessimistic, but as I was listening to him, I, I thought to myself, uh, I don't know, any of us, you both need to be in these rooms when the conversations are being had, if they're being had at all. Because it seems like sort of uh, things are, are, have already gotten ahead of us. I mean, to the extent that my, my friend is making the argument that it's too late. I, I don't think it's too late, so long as things are, whatever, materially changeable in any sense. But, but I think, I think every, basically everything that you're both saying is, is very well, relevant. I think, I think basic, it needs to be basic, elevated quickly before the, it's too late. The basic point <laughs> is that technology has no intrinsic evolutionary logic, right? It, it, it's, we, it has the evolutionary logic that we give it. And it's, it, it's, who is it? its future is not determined. Right. We're the ones who determine its future. It doesn't create its own future. And so the, the philosophical and political theoretical context in which we debate it is decisive. So we go into the third. Let's turn on the third. Yes. So the third objection to the unreconstructed ethic of 
some fashion in him, and important, is the one that I brought under the label of Prometheus. So the core concept of Prometheanism is this idea that the individual saves himself. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it's somewhat of an abuse of the term Prometheanism. Uh, it's a slander on Prometheus. <laughs> because you, if you remember that Prometheus in Greek mythology stole fire to give it to humanity. These Prometheans steal fire to give it to themselves. So it's, 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 uh, a, it's, it's a different idea of Prometheus. And uh, so it's there's a denial. So on the text, on the surface, there are two forms of self-deception. And this relates to your question about the truth that you asked before. So first, the dependence of this agent, the disruptor, the inventor, on the social. And this repeats a theme in a much earlier conversation with humanity about the hero and the heroic ethic. So the hero likes to think that he forms his own mission and he can then be indifferent to the society. But the hero receives his mission from the non-heroes. Huh? And although the hero despises the crowd, the hero craves the adulation of the crowd. Uh, and this is repeated in this relation of the disruptors to the others. So there's a denial of the reality of the dependence. Huh? Uh, so this misrepresentation of the relation of self to others is the text. And the subtext of Prometheanism is the denial of the irreparable flaws in the human condition. Our mortality, our groundlessness and our insatiability. Prometheanism is a form of triumphalism, as if a, a desperate assertion of vitality could deny the reality of death, as if in a vacuum of meaning the individual could ground himself on nothing and resolve the problem of insatiability by directing the will to the proxy for God, who is himself. He is, he is the God, where he stands in the place of God in this, in this day. So, and that's why I said last week, it's like a beating of the drums in the presence of death, boundlessness, and immortality. The victor, the Promethean, rides in the chariot, right? like the triumphator in the Roman triumphal procession. In those Roman processions, the triumphator was accompanied by a slave who whispered to his ear while he was receiving the ovations of the crowd, memento mori, remember that you will die. Now the slave is missing. <laughs> in, this, in, this, in this triumphal procession that they imagine. Uh, and this, this, this leads to a form of it's a self-deception that's related to a perversion. So we need to conceive a form of this epic that is not tainted by Prometheus that recognizes this, this, this interdependence, our dependence on the others, and that does not deny these irreparable flaws of the human condition. Because then it becomes just another lullaby, a form of edification, rather than a, than a moral truth. And that's the essence of the argument. I'll be 
extremely grieved from the commentary because that was said so already so eloquently. Um, so as we can see, and we've seen with each of these, um, all of these are playing out in contemporary America, um, oftentimes in ludicrous ways, and incredibly reduced ways. I will just here mention the obvious note. Note the ways that Prometheanism plays out in our daily life in America. And it is all pervasive. So to give some obvious examples, you know, the Twitter feeds. The, you know, how many hits can you get on your Twitter feed? How many hits can you get on your LinkedIn? How many hits can it is incredible? And it is amazing the degree to which we have an entire society that's based upon the great triumph of this, when of course the stakes are so ludicrously low. <laughs> and and yet it's this constant push. So again, Roberto's move here is to say, not only how do we radically grow the sense of significance of what we are doing, but then take out this Prometheanism where it's simply all about me and my extraordinary triumphs to which I get my immediate adulation. And what would this mean in our conduct of life? What would this mean in our daily activities? And again, going back to point number two as well, what would it mean in terms of rethinking the structures of our existence such that it's not so dependent upon the radical, triumphant individual getting these immediate rewards? So, certainly a quick commentary to give time for our discussion. So, discussions of point number three in terms of flaws. Yes, please. I think this is just kind of one of the harder ones for me to wrap my head around because then how do we figure out, like, what's Prometheanism and then what's like good self-care. And then like, let's say I like, you know, I decide I don't want to wear my bike helmet, like riding to school every day. Is that an example of Prometheism? Because it's like, you know, I'm not, like, I, don't get, I don't get it in my heart, I don't lie. Um, okay. Um, so I guess, I don't know, you know, like where do we, I mean, I see the Twitter makes perfect sense. Twitter makes perfect sense of how that's an example of Prometheism, but like, I feel like life's so much more complicated than, you know, I do other things than get on Twitter every day or TikTok or, you know, whatever else. So how do you, like, figure out what's Prometheism and what's not? It's Prometheism, I, if it's a denial of the reality of our dependence. <coughs> Defending your life is not Prometheism. But, okay. but if you deny your dependence on the others, that is Prometheanism. And if you deny these irreparable flaws in the human condition, it is also Prometheanism. The idea is that a demonstration of power mm -hmm. can somehow crowd out or silence all of this stuff. Then you have Prometheanism. <coughs> okay. So then me not wearing my bike helmet probably wouldn't be Prometheanism. No, you're exempted. <laughs> I might add, I mean, you even see this very clearly in Nietzsche, go back to a thing you read. So the Ubermensch, of course, is this extraordinary figure that first people laugh at because they don't understand what he's really saying. But if you follow the narratives, there's always that moment when suddenly the people realize, ah, this is the Ubermensch guiding us to a new world, which is purely Promethean. It assumes, well, the claim is, I should say, the claim is it's the radical Ubermensch standing above the, the herd, and yet, in practice, it is completely dependent upon the Ubermensch giving these new values to the herd, who then recognize, of course, the Ubermensch as the Ubermensch, which means it perfectly plays out this Prometheanism, wherein the claim is the Ubermensch standing against the crowd, and yet it's totally dependent upon the crowd to get the adulation to prove the, the power and overwhelming brilliance of the Ubermensch. And so that is a grander example, and the Twitter feed is the, <laughs> the absurdly mundane example, and it plays out the exact same logic. So there's a, a pamphlet written by the German philosopher Slaughter called Nietzsche Apostle, which I, I recommend to you. Because its theme is this Promethean, and its lesser forms in contemporary culture. Uh, um, 
these restricted forms of adulation that are, according to Slaughter Dyke, Slaughter Dyke are only one step removed from depression, from collective depression, uh, in which the objective is affirmation. Yes, absolutely. And, yes. And in the United States, this has a tradition and a tradition of positive thinking. From yes. William James all the way up to Absolutely. Norman Vincent Peale and Billy yes. Graham. Right? Yes. Could you spell out that relationship between positive thinking and Prometheanism? I didn't, I didn't follow. Because positive thinking is only one step removed from this idea, from, from, from the illusion of Prometheanism. Right? <laughs> Meaning I can lift myself up with my own thoughts as opposed my, to being in with relationship. My own thoughts, denying this dependence, uh, half denying the reality of death, the yeah. groundlessness of insatiability, okay. and developing a world in which the individual is fine. Now, now what's what is what's the cost? We, this is wasn't made explicit in this conversation. What's the cost of this self-deception? So we lose the greatest cost is that we lose the basis on which to awaken from our rudinized existence. Right? So this was the and this was the role that, for example, existentialism, the works of Heidegger and of Jean Paul Sartre played in the 20th century. So with this idea that the antidote to this positive thinking, to this diminished Promethean, is to terrorize ourselves so that we can awaken from this sonambulant existence of routine and live in such a way that we can then, instead of dying by extraordinary, in this sugar coated set of compromises, die only once. Uh, and so the loss of that incitement to enter fully into the possession of life is the greatest cost of Prometheus. So, just as an example, that book is it called? Win friends and influence movies, or some variation of that. Do you know that it's one of the best selling books in the history of America? <laughs> and it is so telling because that's what the book is about. I don't know what the book is, this Prometheanism is what the book is about. But the basic book is about is how you can behave in such a way that you'll get lots of friends and even enemies will be one to your side. So it's the equivalent of the Twitter feed. Um, and it builds in this absolute routinization where you're not questioning your life, you're not questioning the world around you. Your success is simply, I went over three friends today. I got, I'm, I'm not on Twitter, so I'm not sure the number. I got 200 hits on my Twitter. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. <laughs> but, it's, but it's literally at that level, which means, and this is indeed the cost, you're not questioning anything. You're not trying to rethink your life. You're not trying to rethink the world. You accept the world as it is, accept yourself as you are, and simply try to get a little bit better to have this immediate triumphal return. Three more friends, or 10 more Twitter hits. Now we come to the fourth yes. argument. And the fourth argument seems to me to be philosophically the one that is most, is, is most powerful, is most direct. And what it says is that the unrevised form of the ethic of self-fashioning in Nazi's poem is empty. That this is an empty idea of time. So remember I cited Lear, I shall do such things I know not what, but they will be the terror to the earth. Uh, so the individual struggles to achieve this autonomy. And what will he do with it? So, and what is this concept of autonomy that seems to be entirely empty? Right? Because autonomy must be manifest in some activity, in some form of life. And this activity or form of life is never described by the philosophers of these philosophers of agency of vitality. So we could have a thought experiment of the following kind. 
just to clarify what the issue is. So we have a causal picture of all of the influences on our actions, and social influences, cultural influences. So let's factor that out and say we're not fully autonomous. We don't have autonomy if we're just operating at the behest of that social and cultural program. So let's say we isolated that. And then there's the question of our genetic endowment and its expression in the temperament and all of that. And to radicalize the argument, we say, well, that too we can't take into account. And there's one final bridge to cross, which is then the coherent way of being that we develop our character. And if we are at the mercy of our character, are we truly free? So Nietzsche had this idea, we form the character, we chisel it like a statue. We make ourselves into an icon or a monument. But it's questionable that that's freedom. So that too would have to be factored out. Now what's left when we factored out all of those causal influences? It seems that what's left is nothing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and, there, and where does the content of the idea of autonomy come from? That is the question. So I would say the content of the idea of autonomy, the content has to come from our connections to other people, our attachments on the one hand, and from our engagements. Our engagements mean we take sides. Uh, in all the conflicts of the world, and we have these connections. Now, the connections subject us to rejection, rebuff. The connections may fail, and the taking of sides also has risk, because we may take the wrong side, and come to understand later that we took the wrong side. And Dante Alighieri, whom I cited last week, said, those who never took sides never really lived. So he directly associates this taking of sides with living. Uh, this, this is the expression of vitality. So it's from the combination of those connections and engagements that the content of autonomy, if it does have a content, apart from all of these causal influences, arises. And, and Engagements in the context informed by what I called last week our epiphanies and our prophecies. So our epiphanies are the surprising discoveries of the possibilities of experience, uh, which in general are unplanned. They're, they're serendipitous. And they're the stuff of life. We see that things are not what they thought they were. And that there are possibilities which are only manifest to us when we no longer operate at an ironic distance from the world, but are acting. Those are the epiphanies. And these epiphanies then inform and inspire our prophecies, which are anticipations of a greater life. Uh, and if there's a sense to autonomy, that must be the sense. That is, it's what we, what we come to possess through our taking of sides, our engagements, and our connections to other people, driven by our epiphanies and our prophecies. And that leads to a very different conception of autonomy. Uh, because then the question is, under what conditions of more, under what form of personal life and, or, and what conditions of the organization of society are we, like, are we more likely to produce this content, this content of our engagements and connections, and to be inspired by these epiphanies and these prophecies? Uh, and then our lives, we will ascend. 
but this is the form by which we will ascend. That's a very different picture from the picture that's present, presented to us by liberal political theory or by the philosophers of agency. Uh, and that's then what I would propose as the alternative to this naked theory of autonomy. <clears throat> yes. And let us open this up immediately. So this, of course, is the fourth point. So let us turn to the topic of autonomy. But obviously, you're welcome, since it's sort of just the, the, in many ways, the, the key philosophical point. Feel free to raise so this question, question right, Michael. If, if, yes. we, if, we, if we respond, as I argue we should, to each of these objections, and we reshape the ethic of self-fashioning and non-conformity accordingly, what is left, that is, is what is left still this ethic in its recognizably, in its recognizable form? Or have, or, so really there are two questions. Does something remain? And is what remains, is what does remain, tangibly connected to what was previously recognized as the ethic of self-fashioning in either form? Or have we, by these arguments, created something entirely different? So I think the answer to those two questions is different. So I think something does remain, uh, very much so. But I'm not sure whether what remains would be recognizable as a version of the ethic of self-fashioning and unimportant. Very interesting. Very. And let me just add, um, in two weeks, we will, of course, be turning to the ethics of connection, beginning with early Confucianism, and then this, that next week, it's reconstitution. And this will be one of the key questions, because these, in some ways, will appear in the reconstituted form to be similar, and yet they will appear to me, I think we'll see, Grave differences because of the different starting points. So, anticipating this argument, I think, yes. what, what, what has seemed to me to be the case coming from our arguments last year yes. is that as we reshape these two ethics under the force of arguments like the ones that we refer to today, the two ethics come closer together. Uh, that is, they they give up, they're forced to give up uh, their, their flawed and obviously defective forms. They move closer and they, they, they lose those attributes which they had by virtue of their historical association with particular societies and cultures like the United States and China. But I don't think they become the same. So, so they move closer together, that's the first point. And the second point is that their political implications, like the politics of deep freedom, may be widely convergent. So they have similar political implications. But I don't think they become the same. And their implications for the conduct of life are more different than their implications for the organization of society. And that does agree with a view which has been developed in American liberal political theory by philosophers like Rawls. That the same political and economic arrangements can be justified on the basis of alternative philosophical views the idea of overlapping consensus in liberal societies. So I think that's the, that's the situation to which I anticipate we're moving. And I very much agree. I think we will indeed see a great deal of overlap when we get to the political implications of these ideas. But I very much agree that in terms of the conduct of life, both at a grand philosophical level, but even at the level of our daily mundane lives, there are still stark differences between having a starting point being self-fashioning, that is then being reworked, versus, as we will see, a starting point being pure relationships. I mean, as we'll see with Confucianism, 
everything, everything in the world is relationships, and that it's all about how you refine and alter and improve those relationships. And I think we will see, even in its reconstituted form, it has dramatically different implications than the self fashioning version, even though, as Roberto has mentioned, politically, it will be a tremendous So when we problem. deal with the ethics of connection and responsibility, of which Confucianism is the consummate philosophical expression, we're going to make a distinction between the minimalist form and the maximalist form of this idea. Which is the equivalent to this distinction yes. we're making between the uncorrected and the corrected versions of the ethic of self -action. And the distinction has to do with two sets of differences. So one set of differences is the extent to which the ethic accepts the established organization of society as the template that it then seeks to humanize or to improve, as opposed to rejecting it and having a radically transformative program. The second distinction between the minimalist and the maximalist forms has to do with the extent to which the corrected ethic uh, admits conflict, contradiction, disharmony in the self, right? Uh, and that results in two different versions of this, of this moral idea. But it's a complicated exercise that we have to perform. Because in dealing with the ethic of self-fashioning, we're dealing with something that is the product of modern Western history. As I said, its history is inseparable from the history of this revolutionary project of the last 300 years. The classic expression of the ethic of connection is more than 2,000 years old. So then we have several tasks. So we have the task, first, of interpreting what the essential message of the ancient teaching was, uh, and doing it in a vocabulary that we can understand today. Then we have the task of formulating a modern counterpart to that ancient teaching. So, because there has to be an equivalent to the ethic of self fashioning translated in today. And that equivalent, then, we have to be able to present in two different forms, more or less ambitious, more or less transformative, with respect to both self and society. That's complicated operation. It's so complicated that it's easier to understand why it hasn't happened. Indeed. And, and to underline this, an added layer of, of complexity is the fact that the reason we'll be turning back to early Confucianism is we'll at least be arguing that is its most powerful philosophical articulation to build upon the rethinking because the form that will take over beginning in the 12th century, where you'll get a state-based form of Orthodox Christianity, um, we, we put this under the general category of Neo-Confucianism, that is the view that becomes dominant in China in late imperial times. It's the, it's the version that right now Xi Jinping is referring back to, and we will at least be arguing that is not the version we want to be building from. <laughs> and so not only are we leaping 2,000 years in our reconstruction, we are going to be actively working against the kinds of rereading of the tradition that have actually become dominant for several centuries, including right now with the current resurrection in China. So it, it will be a very complex maneuver we will be attempting. <laughs> So, but I do want to insist on this theme that came up at the end of the last class, which is even after we reconstruct the ethic of self-hashing in these four ways yes. that these four arguments signal, uh, something remains which is distinctive to it. So what, what first remains is this idea that the target, the agent, the protagonist of all of this is still the self. The, the ego embodied in an individual organism on the way to death. Yes. Uh, 
and, <coughs> as opposed to something else, as opposed to uh, interpersonal relations, as, as in the other effort. The second thing that remains is the non-finitistic conception of the self, because we transcend. Vitality is excess over structure, and we become more human by becoming more godlike. It's not that we live to become more godlike, it's that we become more godlike to live by increasing our attributes. Our share in this divine attribute of transcendence, we enhance our vitality. Uh, that's what I mean by this non finitistic idea of the self. The third thing that remains is this intimate internal relation to the revolutionary program of the last 300 years. Uh, because this ethic, the history of this ethic, is inseparable from the history of that program. And the fourth thing that remains is a moral psychology, an attitudinal impulse, which treats the disruptors, the inventors, the nonconformists as the saving remnant, the spiritual aristocracy of the human race. We should look for trouble. And the troublemakers are the salt of the earth. That remains in all versions of this ethic and is in complete contradiction to the dominant tendencies in moral philosophy throughout the history of humanity. This doctrine that we've been studying here uh, is an abomination from the standpoint of the dominant tendencies in world moral philosophy. Is it not? It absolutely is, <laughs> indeed, indeed. And we will at least be arguing in a reconstituted form. Oh, yes, sorry. Oh, yes, we apologize, yes. And I, I, don't know. I, I just have a question about like deep freedom. And is it possible to contrast deep freedom like to other conceptions of freedom that we have? So people talk about negative freedom, like freedom from people should like intervene in my choices, basically. And then you have this kind of like freedom to get what I want. It's like some kind of like either like positive conception of freedom or freedom of empowerment or something. And then I guess you have like freedom as self realization. And that can I guess be spelled out in different ways. I don't think it fits those categories. Hmm? I don't think it fits. No, exactly. I'm just like wondering. It seems like maybe like freedom as control or as like freedom as transcending structures seem to be like closer to. No, I think it's an idea. So, the yeah. The core idea, with now thinking of, as I said, the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, is the ordinary man and woman ascends to a form of life with greater capabilities, broader scope, and more intensity. So it has to do, it's a characterization of life. It's freedom as vitality. That's the core conception. And I don't know whether that conception would fit more easily with so-called positive or negative freedom. I think it includes both. And furthermore, the idea is that uh, the individual must have a haven of vitally protected interests, safeguards, and capability ensuring endowments, which has been the concern of historical social democracy. Give him this haven. But he, there must also be, around this haven, a storm of innovation, of conflict. So social life must be rendered plastic, open. So we give the individual this haven so that he can flourish and act in the midst of all of this change and conflict. It's not as the antidote to the, to the conflict. So the theme of institutionally conservative social democracy is the humanization of the inevitable. And it begins and ends in the discourse about the haven. The other part, the part about the storm, is missing. So the conception of freedom 
has to be read against the background of those ideas. And that's what I mean by group freedom. And that's why uh, it's not just a discourse about entitlements uh, and safeguards. It's a discourse about what way of organizing politics and the economy would make sense of this radicalized innovation. In other words, the, the, the tangible economic and political institutions of society have to become, as it were, the collective embodiments of the imagination. The imagination in power. So, if I don't understand it correctly, it's like, so it seems like the fight is like, so when you are in a fight with someone, or you're like in some kind of deep argument, then you are like awakened, you are like present. Uh -huh. And is that the point? So I think many people see the fight, the struggle, as like necessary to get somewhere, and then we can relax when we win. But it's the point that basically life should be about being in that struggle all the time, because that's when we're most fully alive. And that's like all in and then the institutions wouldn't matter because it would be just the process. Yeah. So, 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 so contrast this to the Hegelian idea, right? In which we begin with a situation in which the subjectivity is totally at home with the institutions of the primitive society. So, the the spirit hasn't taken yet. Cognizance of itself. We are identified with the institutions. That's how Hegel describes the earliest period. Then there's a long period of estrangement in which the spirit discovers that the structure of society is incompatible with its contradictions and its aspirations. And then there's a final moment in which the spirit is finally at home because there is a set of institutions that is compatible with our subjectivity. And that would be objective freedom. Now, each of the elements of this narrative is unacceptable on the view which I just stated. There never was a moment in which we were totally at home. There is no canonical bridge or passage from the earlier one to the latter one. And certainly, the events of European moral history do not set the canon for humanity. And there will not be a final moment in which we can say we are definitively at home. Nevertheless, one structure can be better than another, uh, although no structure will be our final home. So that's, that's the view. And, and the concept of freedom, and the view is related to the philosophy of vitality or agency in this sense, that our progress along this route, never necessary, but always possible, it involves coming more fully into the possession of life. Uh, that we, we awaken from this runinized existence uh, on the way to death, facing our groundlessness. Uh, and every moment counts. And we don't die little by little by installments. We live until we die. And we only die once. And, and so that's the moral or psychological counterpart to the idea of being free. And with that, uh, there are a couple of hands up. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we will have to close things now. That is OK. Please remember your questions, because all of these themes will continue in two weeks. Again, we will turn to the ethics of connection. It's reconstitution after that, and then the comparison between them. So the many questions we didn't have a chance to get to, they're absolutely will be time to bring them up. Meanwhile, we wish you a wonderful spring break, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks when we are grand speed through global philosophy. We turn to Confucianism and rethinking all of our assumptions we've been doing this so far in the course. Thank you so much, and see you in two weeks.